church. It's great to be in church. Let's turn to 391 and sing this song, Trust and Obey. Trust and Obey. Now, this song isn't just for kids, all right? When I was a kid, I thought this was written just for me. <laughs> and it was written for me, but it's not just for me. It's for all of us. We need to trust the Lord and obey his word, no matter what age you are. Let's stand and sing it together. 391. When we walk with God, Shadow can rise, not a cloud in the sky. 
for the Lord. Lord, thank you so much for this day you've given to us. It's another blessing from your hand. Lord, I pray that we'll look at it that way. And Lord, be grateful because we owe you, Lord. You, you gave us your life. We could never pay you back. Lord, you can use what we do give you. So I pray we'll give joyfully and cheerfully uh, this morning just because we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 from uh, Tanya and Stephen and the family. We had a wonderful time meeting our new grandson, Daniel. And uh, if you want to see something cute, you can look at my YouTube channel where he sings to his grandma and grandpa. Uh, it, it's, it's really moving because the day before, he realized we were leaving and he just started wailing. Tanya had to calm him down. He was just crying so hard. and uh, But it was a blessing to be with him. And he's got a tender heart. He really does. And so, but I want to read you a wonderful note. This is from Sabrina. And she sent a handwritten letter. She said, Dear Church family, I miss all of you very much and want to say thank you to anyone who is praying for me. I have been doing really well in all my classes. So that must be an answer to prayer. I want you all to know that I'm praying for Camp Lake Baptist Church and everyone in it. If there is anyone who wants to send me a letter, my dad will happily provide the address. You don't have to send me one, but it would mean a lot if anyone did. And so I asked Lee, because I found out her address, and it's in the bulletin. If you want to send her a card, and just maybe send a card that just says, I'm praying for you. Something like that would be a blessing. You know, we found out her dad, Herb, is in the hospital with um, pneumonia. 
So we need to really pray for him. It's a serious thing. My dad died of pneumonia when he was 47 when I was in college. And so it's nothing to take lightly. Uh, so be praying for her. But we'll mention him in prayer again in church Sunday school time. But I want to thank you for praying. Thank Pastor Mark again for uh, conducting everything here at the church while we were gone. We had such a wonderful trip. Safety. And I'm very, very thankful. Thanks for your prayers. That's good to see you two back as well. No, it's when the shepherds are gone, hey. right? When the shepherds Sorry, are gone. Around All right, any birthdays this last week? You had a birthday. <laughs> oh, dude. Saying trust and obey. Now we're going to sing the obedient song. O B I E. John writing this book. Well, let's go back and, and talk about prayer requests before we get into chapter 21. That's where we'll be, John 21. I was sad to hear that Herb had pneumonia. I was in the hospital, and I heard that he was moved to Blodgett. And so I'll be trying to get over and see him before we take off on this uh, trip up to Kobiak. We're going up to the, to the summit uh, Monday and Tuesday, so pray for our safety. Pastor Mark and Kim get to go as well. It's always a real re refreshing time, and uh, so we're looking forward to that. 
I did get to see Craig yesterday uh, on my way down. I was preaching at Isaac's church a part. I was just one workshop. Uh, they had a, he had a main speaker that preached twice. Brother Gary Bill, who's been here uh, about five or six years ago, he was one of the preachers. And we had wonderful food, wonderful fellowship. But on my way, I stopped to see Craig. And I was really happy because he recognized me. And uh, he knew who I was. So, But he was, he was quite combative. They had him tied down. I think in moving him from ICU to the sixth floor, uh, that kind of messed up in his mind, and Judy wasn't with him when that was going on, so he got kind of uh, confused. And uh, so really need to pray for Judy. It's been rough on her as well. Uh, the good news is uh, there's hope because, uh, you know, when he was in a coma, we didn't know if he was going to come out of that. We didn't know if he was going to have his mental facilities and all that. So there are little footsteps of prayers answered, getting along to larger things. So you be praying, please, for Craig and for Judy. Um, I'm just thankful, as I mentioned from the reading, before reading the letter a little while ago, oh, how thankful for we are for all the traveling mercies and meeting Daniel. That was a blessing. Let's not forget to pray for uh, Renee and Rose's daughter, uh, Rose's daughter, Renee's stepdaughter, Laura, who uh, she's, I think, 43, and she had a stroke. And uh, so be praying for her. Um, <clears throat> having a hymn sing tonight. Looking forward to that with Maranatha. Keep praying for Pastor Mark's dad. He's doing well. Esther needs our prayers. Um, she finally went after a week of pain. Uh, she finally went into the infirmary and got checked out. She is having some issues in her stomach. It's causing pain. I don't know if she has an ulcer or, uh, you know, GERD or, you know, one of those acid reflux things, but she's been in a lot of pain and, and really needs healing. So keep Esther Gates in your prayers, please. And then the um, thing I want to keep before us is to keep praying for Daniel's salvation. Um, he's not saved yet, and uh, I'll tell you, we watched it and see the struggles that Tanya goes through. Bless her heart. It's, um, it's not easy. It, it is not easy, but um, he's a loving young man. I'm, I, I, he's got a tender heart. I believe he will see, receive Christ uh, soon. So be praying for that. Who, who else? Let's about unspokens. Do we have some unspokens? Yes. And uh, let's be praying for Tom's wife, Carol. Um, she flies in late tonight back home. She's been down in Florida also. Uh, let's pray for safety and traveling mercies for her. And uh, Joan, I'm glad to hear you're better. Thank you. I know you weren't able to be there Friday night, and Mary mentioned that you were sick. So right. praise the Lord for that. Mm -hmm. uh, who else has a prayer request uh, this morning? You might have something you'd like to mention. Anyone? All right, if not, let's go to prayer, and we'll get into this last chapter of John. Dear Lord, as we um, come before you this morning, we thank you that you are almighty God. As you said in Matthew, Jesus, that all power is given unto you in heaven and in earth. And we believe in your power to heal. I pray that you would heal her beyond, Lord. I pray that you would heal uh, Craig Nelson. I pray for this Laura. We don't know her personally, but we know her through her parents. And we pray for her, that you would heal her as well. Lord, there are many others on our prayer list that we talk about on Tuesday nights that we hold before you for healing. People with cancer, uh, people with various diseases that are, uh, Lord, as your word said that when people brought the sick to you, you healed everyone. And uh, we know you, the power is present to heal from you. And we ask that you would do your will in that regard. I do pray for, um, and tonight's hymn sing, that it would be a blessing to both churches. I pray it would be well attended. I pray, Father, for the message a little later in the morning service, that you would um, give me utterance and power from the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Lord, that it's not about me, but about your precious word. <clears throat> I pray for Pastor Richard Gates and his um, situation down there. Keep him in health. And Lord, we also ask for healing for Esther. 
knowing that she's been in pain this week. Please give her relief and healing. Lord, I pray for Daniel's salvation. Thank you for that little guy. I pray that you would do a work of healing with him as well. I pray that you would just help there to be some improvement in some of his condition. And Lord, we know that you're able. Please protect Carol Cecil as she flies home tonight. Give her a safe return. Now, Lord, bless the precious word to us as we read it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. In chapter 21, um, you know that back in the earlier part of chapter 20, that uh, Jesus, in telling uh, Mary and in speaking, she said, uh, tell your brethren I'll go before them into Galilee. And that's mentioned in one of the Gospels. I think it might be in 21, but I, I know it's somewhere uh, in there. But anyway, and so here it is. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Another name. There's actually a town on the west side um, called Tiberias, named after one of the Roman emperors. And of course, many things in Israel were named like Caesarea. Uh, you know, Caesarea Philippi was a different Caesarea. And, you know, if you look at the map over there, there is definite imprint of the uh, effects of the Roman uh, occupation. But here it is, the Sea of Tiberias. The Bible also calls it Galilee. Uh, it's called Gennesaret in another couple of places. So very interesting, low-lying lake surrounded by hills and mountains. Uh, it's fed on the north side by a, the river that comes down from, uh, actually from Syria, uh, from the waters of the melting of Mount Hermon snow that come through and the mountains and so forth. And um, it's a pretty interesting place. It can get very rough as we know the Lord uh, was sleeping in the boat when uh, they were uh, thought they were going to perish and they awoke him and he said, peace be still. Uh, it's the place where Jesus walked on the water uh, and Peter too. Uh, it is a very interesting place. Uh, very worth visiting if you ever go to Israel. Very, very beautiful place. And so it says, on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon, Peter, and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go fishing. They say unto him, We go, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Now it's an interesting thought um, that they still had access after they have left all. And follow the Lord. You know, they did that. They left all. He said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. But in this interlude after the resurrection, they're back in the area and they decide to go fishing. Undoubtedly, it was either uh, James and John's dad's boats, uh, you know, how they had been working for their dad and left. Uh, it was maybe an old boat of Peter's. I don't know. But he said, I'm going fishing. I don't know about you, but that I grew up fishing. It's always been a joy of my life. And I can say, I spent more time being done saying, we caught nothing. <laughs> it seemed like we came back more times than, than that we did catch something, and especially in my early days of fishing. But uh, pretty uh, pretty normal. But they fished. They, they fished at night, and they caught nothing. Um, nighttime fishing is pretty common. Uh, we used to do it. Uh, I, I can remember sitting out in a boat with my dad and uh, he had a lantern hanging out there and we were catching fish. We had different methods we used, but it was always enjoyable uh, to do that and to spend that time with him. Sometimes it's dangerous. My dad and my cousin went on a night fishing trip because of the, the word was out that all of these, um, what they call crappies in the north, they call specks down south, um, were running. Big crappies were running in Lake Okeechobee. So they drove down there and put in the boat. It was an untried, untested boat. It had um, a big motor on the back. It was a bass boat. And the wires are, I should say, cables that go through a hole down underneath the fiberglass hollow back up to the 
throttle and the steering cable, those holes, one hole on the side was put in too low. So they were in a rough water and the water was splashing over on that, I guess you would call it transom, gunwale. And it was running into that, but going right into the bottom of the boat. So as they fished during the night, it got to about two in the morning, they were doing okay. And my dad said to my cousin Joe, do you hear something rattling? He goes, yeah, it's like there's something, it's like the gas can is floating. He goes, oh, that can't be good. And when they opened the hatch, because it was sealed up, when they opened that hatch, it went and the boat flipped up and turned up like that, and they had to jump out. And so they were hanging onto this boat. And you might think, well, all of Lake Okeechobee is a shallow, but not all of it. They were in a channel. So they were hanging on this boat, screaming, help, help, help. And somebody sat over there and they thought, we're not gonna help those drunks this time. Found out later, some drunks were out there the night before just hollering help for the fun of it. Kind of like the boy who cried wolf. These guys finally came and they said, we thought you guys were those drunks. They said, no, we're not drunks. We're, we're about to die, help us. And so they helped them. They pulled the boat over to the side and righted it and pulled it up and they got able to drain it out and, and they got them out of the water. But they came close to dying on Lake Okeechobee. So fishing at night could be dangerous, you know? But they were fishing at night and caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. What do you think? Why wouldn't they know it's Jesus? Kind of seems to be a pattern since his resurrection. Mary didn't recognize him. Uh, the two on the road to Emmaus didn't recognize him. Um, it could be other reasons, fog, um, low visibility, early morning light might be a reason they didn't recognize him. But, uh, and it could be how he looked, you know, they saw him, some of them, at least Peter, James, and John, saw him transfigured. That's not how he appeared in his normal appearances to them. The transfiguration of his glory that we will see him like in heaven. Um, they saw that on the mount, probably Mount Hermon. But I just think they didn't recognize him because he looked probably vastly different after his crucifixion than he did before. Uh, we might think in terms of this. His nails piercings and his side were one thing, but he also endured such a beating that he might not have been recognizable uh, to them. May not have had a beard anymore. They plucked it out. Uh, who knows? But we don't know why they didn't recognize him. And so they knew not uh, that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, Children, have you any meat? They answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. In other parts of the gospels, it talks about this happening on another time. And um, that was when, really kind of when they first met Jesus and the net broke and it was, the boat was sinking as they were putting the fish in. And they were um, very convicted about their sinfulness. And it was at that time that they left, uh, at least uh, James and John, they left their dad and they went to follow Jesus. So this is not the first time that he has said to them, cast your net on the other side. And here he says, cast your net on the right side. Now we don't need to worry about the right to the left and that kind of thing, but here it is. What we should do should be at Christ's direction. When we have direction from Christ in the Bible, we need to follow that. Um, we're stubborn, aren't we? We have our own way. We're, we can make things work. We can do things. And uh, we don't need anybody telling us what to do. This is God. This is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And when he directs them to do something, uh, notice they said no as far as no fish. And uh, on the other side, is, um, the other time that this happened, if, if it was either Peter or one of them, they said, nevertheless, you know, we've not caught it. We've worked all night and not caught anything. We're, we're experts. 
We, this is our business. We know what we're doing. Nevertheless, you know, we'll humor you and we'll put it on the other side. That's what happened the first time. And they were breaking their net. This time, no net was breaking. Interesting, isn't it? It says, they were not, now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked, and he did cast himself into the sea. Uh, yeah, these were rough, rough, tough guys, you know. There weren't any women out there. They weren't worried about, uh, you know, they're working hard, sweating like crazy, getting all wet anyway. And so he had taken his fisher's coat off and was, the Bible says he was naked. Uh, I would rather go fishing with people that keep the clothes on myself, okay? <laughs> But uh, it was maybe that kind of tradition that they did. And so when he realized it's the Lord, uh, I, I got to get my, I got to put it back on. So he girded himself, his fisher's coat on him, and he cast himself into the sea. He jumped in. Um, partly because that's kind of what you did with these kind of boats. They probably had a keel on them. Um, they were of a nature, would hold several men. And you can only get them so close. You, I've been to the Sea of Galilee and I've seen how it's gradual, at least on the side we were out near Tiberias there, uh, between Tiberias and the south end. And it's, it's a gradual, I'm sure there are docks like you see at lakes and stuff around here, but where we were, there weren't any. And if you were to come up to that shore, um, you wouldn't be able to bring that boat all the way to the shore. So he jumped off and he comes up um, to the uh, uh, probably to pull the nets up. Let's see. It says, um, and the other disciple came in a little ship for they were not far from land, but as it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid thereon and bread. Oh, what a wonderful shore lunch the Lord is already making. He doesn't even have a net. Uh, he doesn't have a boat. But they're bringing that net up there, which is valuable. It says it's going to be 153 great big fish. It, that, that's valuable catch. Um, but Jesus already has the fish on there. He's got some hush puppies and some, uh, uh, you know, how does it describe it? He's got bread, all right? There were fires of coals there and fish laid on and bread. And he said unto them, bring up the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, a hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was the, not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, come and dine. Now I've heard, heard one commentator make a point. When you compare these two events, the first time the net broke and the, the statement was made, um, that is a picture of human effort. No matter how um, how strong we think we are, no matter how much we think we know, um, our efforts are usually not as successful when we compare them to what God directs us to do. And what God does, notice the net wasn't broken, uh, a massive amount of fish. And so that was a commentator about these two events. So it's, it makes sense. So, um, so he says, come and dine, come and dine. Oh, how good that must have tasted. Oh, I've been on a few shore lunches. First time I ever went on one up here. Now, I've been on many of them growing up in the Florida. But the first time I went on one up here was uh, Stephen's dad, Steve DeWitt, took me fishing. We went to uh, Little Pine Island. And uh, there's an island there. So we went out to the island. And um, I didn't know. He had brought a little grill. It was like packed away. And uh, he fired up that, had a green can on it. And he lit that grill and he says, I, because we didn't catch nothing that day. And uh, which is rare whenever you're fishing with Steve back in those days, he was an excellent fisherman. And so he pulled out some steelhead and we cooked that. He cooked that on that little grill and that was so good. He had some other items to eat with it, some crackers and cheese and uh, I'll never forget that. That he said, "This is a great shore lunch," and we had uh, here the people coming up, and they hear Jesus saying, "Come and dine." You know, the Lord cares about our physical needs, doesn't He? And He meets our needs. He wants to provide. 
He wants you to enjoy uh, what he gives you. And so he says, come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. And I think that also kind of points to his appearance. Um, even though they didn't quite recognize him, they knew it was the Lord. His voice didn't necessarily change. But undoubtedly, this is the very fact that none of them dared to say, who are you? Because they must not have been able to just looking at him, see the same Jesus that they were used to seeing before the death, burial, and resurrection. So they know that knowing it was the Lord. Then Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fish likewise. Now is the, this is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Well, let's rehearse something for a minute. We know he appeared to them the first night of his resurrection that night, Thomas was absent. And then it says eight days later, he appeared to him again, Thomas present. We know about that. Now is the third time. I'm, I think it means with all of the 11 of them together. This is now the third time as a unit. Uh, and it's up in Galilee. I always have this question that I won't get answered till I get to glory. I wonder who else the Lord was appearing to and speaking to that aren't mentioned in the scriptures. Um, as verse 25 will say, and there, also, there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. So only so much is revealed to us uh, in the scripture about what Jesus did in these 40 days. Um, that's interesting that is shared with us about the walk on the road to Emmaus. Very interesting. And how they were, they didn't recognize Jesus until he was sitting at meat with them and eating food and then boom, he was caught out of the way. Um, it seems like Jesus has the ability, and I'm sure he does because he's God, but in his glorified state or in his resurrected body to just materialize, to appear because they had the doors locked that first night and Jesus came in. The second time he appeared to them the same way. They were in the upper room with the doors locked for fear of the Jews and Jesus just appeared. Um, here he, he comes and meets them while they're fishing all night. Uh, Jesus is somewhere, um, maybe praying, maybe visiting other people, we don't know. But for 40 days, I believe Jesus didn't just go uh, and, and hide. I believe he spoke to people. He probably found and reassured some of the people he had healed, some of the people he had saved, uh, you know, made appearances to them. Very, very possible. But we don't know for sure. Anybody have a question up to this point? This appearance of Jesus to the disciples on the Sea of Galilee at the side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, I love this story. Now we come to the end of the book. And we come to the, the final uh, appearance of the Lord, not necessarily final of the whole 40 days. We know from Acts 1, he was with them on the Mount of Olives when he ascended. But that's back in Jerusalem area. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, this is the same appearance, but a continuation of their talk. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Maybe, maybe Simon Peter was having some, some ideas about starting up his business again. I don't know. When he said more than these, was he talking to people? Was he talking about fish? You know, what is, you know, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. What do you set your affection on? Jesus is asking us, do you love me more than these? And here it is. He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Now it's interesting, and I don't know how much time went by. They might have been sitting there talking and eating and, and just uh, the joy of, of having each other's presence. And might have been a few minutes. It might have been a half an hour. Whatever. 
All of a sudden, Jesus says, he saith unto him again, to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee, he saith unto him, feed my sheep. The significance of feed my lambs and feed my sheep. He's saying, be pastoral to these, be my shepherd, my under shepherd to these people. And in, its, in essence, telling him, you're going to be the leader of this church that's coming up. And um, so when he says, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, he saith unto him the third time. And we know the significance of the third time because Peter denied him three times. The Lord might have been making that point. Painful as it was, it's like pulling a scab off of a wound. It's painful. Lord, you know, why are you bringing this up? Why are you trying to embarrass me? Might have been in mind for Peter, I don't know. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said to them, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou was young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch, stretch forth thy hands and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, follow me. This is a, a reinforcing of his call. He said, follow me to all these men earlier, three and a half years ago. This is a reinforcing of his call. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. But it's also a glimpse of the future. And just think how much power this would impart to Peter to know how he's going to die. What if you got a vision where the Lord said to you, this is how you're going to live. This is how you're going to die. Uh, keep serving me. Don't give up. That's basically what Peter got here. Think about it. He's essence saying you're going to be crucified. You're going to stretch forth your hands. That's what it means. It means crucified. You're going to be crucified for me. Later, according to tradition, nothing not in the Bible, this much is in the Bible, but According to tradition, Peter didn't feel worthy to be crucified like the Lord, and so he asked them to crucify him upside down. How many of you heard that before? Not sure if we can trust that tradition, but I, it's just as good as any other tradition. It comes from things like Fox's Book of Martyrs and, and maybe some secular sources, I don't know. But um, And so here the Lord is reinforcing Peter's call. He's reinforcing his love for him in light of his three times of denying him. Uh, he asked him this three times. It did grieve Peter, but it also, I think, strengthened Peter for what's coming. And so to know how you're going to die and to know he said this, he says, but when thou art old, hmm, when thou shalt be old, Peter at this time was a middle-aged man, probably, in his prime. When thou shalt be old. And every time that Peter had a test a little later when you get into the book of Acts and, and uh, Herod decides to go after and he kills James. You know, that was James's time. That was, a, that was wicked and evil on his part, but God, God knew that was going to happen. And uh, not the first martyr, but one of the first martyrs was James. Stephen was the first, but James was early on. Uh, his head was cut off, like John the Baptist. And he thought, oh, this is really pleasing to the Jews. I think I'll grab Peter. And Peter was put in prison because there was a feast going on, and, and Herod honored that. He didn't want to, he had to wait till that was over. And here's Peter sitting in prison. And I have a feeling that he sat there and he knew. He's not going to get my head because God already told me how I'm going to die. He's not going to cut my head off because God told me. And so, Lord, help me to get out of here. And that night, the, guard, the gates were open. You know the story of Rhoda coming to the door as Peter knocked. 
And she ran, left him there, and went and told everybody, now nah, you're crazy, you know. That's a great story. But think about the time that he and John uh, went up to the temple to pray, and there was a lame man there, and um, they showed him that he could be uh, healed, and, and he went walking and leaping and praising God. And they didn't like that. They grabbed a hold of those guys, and they scourged them, just like what happened to Jesus before they put him on the cross. And they said, it, it, we, we count it a joy and an honor to suffer for Christ. He knew he had more time to serve God. He could with boldness face these people, these wicked people, whether it be Herod or the, the uh, Jews there. He could boldly keep doing what God had called him to do, follow him. And so he became a powerful leader in the church there in Jerusalem, as you read about it in the book of Acts. Powerful preaching. As well. Now, this statement uh, is interesting, and Peter, Peter's kind of a nosy guy, isn't he? Uh, he hears that, and then he says, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John himself, following, which also leaned on his breast at supper, and said, Lord, which is he, uh, that he's just saying this is what he said when he was leaning on his breast and said, Lord, which is he that betrayed thee? Peter seeth him, saith to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Sometimes we need to be reminded God's called us to do certain things and it doesn't depend on what he calls other people to do. God has given us a mission God has given us a call. God has given us gifts. And we shouldn't stand back and say, well, I'll, I'll do it, Lord, if, if, if that person will do it. I'll do it if somebody goes with me. Remember that one of the, uh, one of the judges who was very uh, uh, weak-minded, trying to think of his name. Uh, Deborah was the judge that actually won the day. What was that man's name that was so weak? that he had to go and ask her to go with him. And she told him, she said, well, I will, but no, no man is going to get the glory. A woman is going to get the glory. And that's when that woman, the tent stake driver, the, the lady named JL, drove a tent through that Cicero's head. Uh, pretty gruesome, isn't it? But it was true. No man got the glory. Forget that particular judge's name, but he had to, to, to I'll go if you go with me. Um, here is John, I mean, Peter, excuse me, saying, Lord, what, what's he going to do? Now, we have to know that Peter and James and John were tight-knit. They were in Christ's inner circle. They were tight. Um, they knew each other much better than the rest of the crowd, the Matthews and even Thomas and Andrews, Peter's brother, who wasn't in the same group. But Bartholomew and Thaddeus and all these guys, um, the one that's missing, of course, is, is, is Judas. So he says, uh, if I say that, if I want him to, to lie, uh, be alive until I come back, what is that to thee? Follow me. But then it's misinterpreted. And isn't that what happens a lot of times with Jesus' words? People hear them the way they want to hear them, and they get misinterpreted. Listen to this. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said unto him, not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry until I come, what is that to thee? That was a hypothetical. We know now, after 2,000 years, he did die. And God's plan was to extend his work on earth to reach more and more people. Uh, but uh, the Lord was just saying, what is that to thee? Sometimes... I've been hurt in my feelings when a boss said something like, ah, that's, not your, that's not your area. That's none of your business. You're on a need to know business. I'll tell you a basis. I'll tell you what you need to know. Otherwise, get your work done. You know, if I was fooling around, uh, not doing my job, asking about somebody else, you might get that kind of a reprimand. And this is kind of what Peter's getting here. Um, don't worry about anybody else. Just do what I ask you to do. How many times have we been through that kind of argument with our children growing up? Uh, don't worry about your brother. Go make your bed and clean your room and be quiet and obey. 
Many times we've had to say that uh, because they're they're always you know nitpicking about each other. That's not fair. You're letting yeah 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 yeah. Just get in there and do it. I saw. Oh, it was funny because Tanya they they use uh, writing sentences a lot and in the arguing that goes on between Silas and Bo and even Daniel, uh, they, he can't write sentences so much, but I've seen Bo have to go in there and write a lot of sentences because he kept arguing, he kept being belligerent and uh, got in big trouble. So he says, if I will that he tarry, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, John is saying about himself, and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true and there are many other things and there are also many other things which Jesus did the which if they should be written every one I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written amen you know our Lord has perfect memory not like we have which is flawed um, it makes you wonder when we get to glory if we'll be able to relive his steps and they live the things that he accomplished on earth because first of all we will have new minds and we'll know all things he will impart to our thinking perfect knowledge so we might have the ability to communicate with God about what he did during that 40 days after his resurrection uh, many other things that he did during his ministry on earth it, it'll be interesting well, I don't know that but just the uh, fact that there should be more things written, but God decided not to. The world couldn't contain the books of what Jesus accomplished. What do you think of the book of John? Anybody want to share? What do you think of that? I think it's a pretty simple book as far as the clarity with which the Lord is making it clear that Jesus is the Son of God. You've got the miracles, the I am statements, um, the, one of the greatest verses in all of the world, John 3, 16. Uh, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. Very profound statements of that chapter. Truly an amazing book, the Gospel of John. Anybody want to share or have any questions about it? Comment? Feel free, okay? All right, let's be dismissed. Lord, thank you for the Gospel of John. I know it's been published just in itself and passed out and people have been saved through it in many places, many occasions. It's a wonderful book. Thank you for the promises that are in it. Like where you said, I will go and prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Lord, there's so many wonderful promises. I will in no wise cast out, you said, to the, everyone that the Father giveth unto you. That's my verse of assurance. I thank you for the tremendous promises that are found in the book of John. Now bless our service that's coming up. We'll give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.